For our next, uh, next talk, I'd like to welcome James Sokol. He's a uh, web development manager at Mozilla, and he'll be uh, talking to us about uh, uh, their security best practices. Yeah, please give him a warm welcome. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about our security best practices at Mozilla. And uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself, what I do, and who I am. Um, as uh, Alan said, Albert said, sorry. Um, I'm one of our web development managers. Um, I'm responsible for the teams that work on a few of our web properties, uh, support, input, the Mozilla Developer Network, which is probably the only one of the three that you might have used if you're a web developer. Um, I'm at James Sokol on Twitter, pretty easy to remember, two S's, and I'm github.com slash jsokol, uh, where a number of the projects that I'll mention are. So um, there is a blog post that should already be up on my blog. Uh, I don't generally put my slides up because my slides are generally, generally pretty useless, so the blog post will have everything uh, that you'll need, and there was a link at the end of the post, uh, or at the end of the uh, slide deck that'll take you there. And, there will be more links, and links to docs, and links to projects, and all that good stuff. So um, first, let me just say, well, what do I mean by best practices? Um, you know, I see lots of tweets and things on Hacker News. There are no best practices. There are only practices and context and all this sort of stuff. So when I say best practices, uh, what am I talking about? Uh, for us, I'm talking about documentation, um, reviewed and shared Python modules, um, code review processes, uh, application template. Um, sometimes we have one correct way to do things. Uh, an example of that is how we do localization in templates. Um, and then some things that come from outside the traditional security realm like our UX. Uh, folks have brought us some you know, UX guidelines that we try to adhere to. Um, so first, I'm gonna, because I told to give you what I, said on the TAN, I'm gonna give you a little history and how we came around to these current set of best practices. So a long, long time ago, um, things at Mozilla Web Dev were pretty scattered. Uh, there were projects in all sorts of frameworks. We used um, PHP, Ruby, we had Kohana in a couple different versions. We had Cake PHP, we had TikiWiki, we had, I think there was some Python someplace, but God knows what framework that was running on. Um, and around the End of 2009, beginning of 2010, we started moving everything to Django. Um, so a couple of projects moved first. Uh, one of the best things about that was that we got to share code. We started out sharing things like a database router that did uh, master-slave, um, you know, read-only slave replication. Uh, we, and one of the first things that we shared, and one of the first Python libraries I ever wrote was uh, Bleach, which is an HTML sanitization library. And the great thing about sharing that is that we write it once, we code review it once, and then we know that it's secure. Um, so over time, in the past couple of years, we've built up a pretty good collection of modules uh, that we know that we trust. Uh, we've built up a collection of documentation and sort of practices and what we, uh, what we do, and we've wrapped that up into a number of things. Um, so like I said, one of them is docs. Um, we call it Web Dev Bootcamp. Uh, and it's sort of more geared toward a person who wants to contribute to Mozilla either because they're a um, community member or a new employee. All of our web dev projects are open source, so we occasionally get community members who want to help out. And so it, Web Dev Bootcamp sort of takes you through everything from what accounts you need to what you should be paying attention to in terms of Bugzilla, in terms of IRC, um, you know, a lot more than specifically security best practices, but it includes some of that. Um, so there's documentation there. There's also documentation in our application template, which I'll get to, which goes into a little more depth about how to code things correctly. Um, the shared libraries. So we share Bleach, um, which is, and you know, when we share, when we write it this way, we publish it as its own open source thing. They're all on um, PyPI, so um, the cheese shop. Eh, that's kind of appropriate. Um, so shared libraries like Bleach, Django Session C-Surf, um, Django Rate Limit, Django CSP. Uh, you know, we have this big collection of shared libraries at this point, Django SHA-2, which is misnamed, but I'll get to that. 
Um, and we wrap all of that into uh, an application template that includes all of these things called Play-Doh. Um, Play-Doh involves, and this is actually a photo that Paul Irish took, which is kind of, I, I like it. It's, you know, a dinosaur like Mozilla. Um, it's even red. But uh, it's all of that sort of stuff, all of those defaults, um, executes monkey patches, you know, I know we sh shouldn't monkey patch, but we monkey patch cookies so that it sets things differently by default. Um, and a lot of docs are in the Play-Doh uh, application template as well, so that's all up on read the docs. Um, and the key part of that is Fun Factory. Obviously, you can't have Play-Doh without the Fun Factory. And Fun Factory is uh, just a collection of code that does things for Play-Doh. Um, it's available as its own, on its own. You could install it into your own project that was not Play-Doh, it would be a little bit weird. You'd have to go through and add some stuff to manage that pie, but it's, if you're using Play-Doh, then it's already there. Otherwise, um, Fun Factory is available. It includes a bunch of useful things. It includes some things that are mostly useful for us, but. Um, and then I wanna make one little note about UX. Uh, so occasionally, we will have a request from security folks, that is something that we traditionally call a best practice, um, that is what we'd call a user experience worst practice, like CAPTCHAs. Um, so, you know, user experience is, is a big part of everything we do. Um, you know, sometimes user experience is at odds with security, uh, and you have to be a little bit creative about how you get around that, because you don't want this guy. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, uh, on the other hand, um, accessibility is not. Uh, if you went to Katie Cunningham's work tutorial the other day, um, yesterday, I guess, if you didn't, maybe go get her book that's out now. Um, accessibility and security are not obverse. They are not opposed. They are not related. Um, if somebody tells you that you can't be secure and be accessible, they are wrong. You should correct them with whatever degree of politeness you feel is appropriate for that situation. Um, and then I was wanted to do this earlier, but I'll do it now. Um, there are three other talks uh, this week that if you're really interested in security, especially um, payments and PCI compliance uh, that are worth going to. Tomorrow at 11, there's a talk on payments. In Django. Uh, at 1.30, there's a talk on cryptography in Django. And on Thursday at 4.20, there's an actual talk about PCI compliance. Um, I'm not going to really go into PCI compliance because that's more complex. And finally, uh, there's an organization called the Open Web App Security Project, OWASP. They're a great resource. Um, they have tons of information on their website about typical uh, you know, web app security issues, uh, what the top 10 security issues from 2010. It's a little bit of a weird survey, but um, they do a bunch of really useful info. We are members of it. We contribute stuff to them, take stuff back from them. So, okay, that's sort of how we got our best practices and where they are, but what are they? Um, so I'm gonna start with Password storage. Um, we use a library called Django SHA-2, which is misnamed, but it's for historical reasons, that uses HMAC and bcrypt. Um, you have no excuse not to be using HMAC and either bcrypt or pbkdf2 or scrypt. Um, there are libraries for all of it. Uh, you should be using an expensive hashing function. Using SHA-1 is okay for your dev server, but it is absolutely not okay for production. Um, there are reams of blog posts about why. Um, Django SHA-2 is, it was originally uh, SHA-256 password storage. Now it's a nice um, bcrypt plus HMAC library that will, if your HMAC keys are compromised, you can add new ones and it will transparently rehash uh, users' passwords when they log in for you. Sort of like Django used to do when it had uh, un unsalted MD5s and it would transparently upgrade that to uh, your new hasher. So in one, it's 1.4 compatible, it creates 
hashers for all the HMAC keys. Uh, it's a little bit complicated how it exactly does it, but um, we assume that our database will get leaked at some point, uh, so we use bcrypt and HMAC. Um, using HMAC requires is a second breach, right? Because then you not only need the data, you also need something stored on the server, uh, hopefully a different server someplace else. So it require it you know expands the amount of surface area you have to attack. Um, user data. So Django templates auto escape by default. We don't use Django templates though. We use uh, Jinja because it's better, and we use a template adapter called Jingo. Um, we turn on auto escaping in Jinja, but because it's not on by default. Um, if you have user content, we don't trust that. Like I mentioned, a, a library called Bleach. Bleach is whitelist based, um, which means only tags that you specifically allow um, are, can come through it. So uh, we bleach user content. Um, we just sort of call it bleaching it. Uh, but it's bleach.clean, it's a very simple API. Uh, bleach also can turn things into links if you want it to, it's useful. Um, it uses the same algorithm for parsing text as web browsers do, so it's really a, a very secure way of doing that sort of thing. Um, and it's uh, everything, um, you know, user content, whether it's a description of an add-on or a review of an add-on or a description of a problem somebody's having on the support site, whatever it is, if it is allowed to have HTML at all, it goes through bleach. If it's not, um, it just gets output, never, never marked as safe, uh, auto-escaping does the rest. So everything gets cleaned up. Um, that goes a very, very long way towards solving XSS issues. It doesn't go all the way. The more complicated your app gets, the more little weird areas there are. Um, try not to concat user strings into other string, into HTML in JavaScript. Um, we ran into that once. Um, localization is another sort of tricky spot uh, because you can't, ideally, you would never have HTML in your localized strings, and you know that's sort of the goal. Uh, try to keep HTML out of it so localizers don't have to deal with that, but it's not always possible. Sometimes you need to mark a word in a phrase so that it's a specific word mark or something like that. Um, so you know sometimes you need to localize this. And what we've done, we have a tool called Tower, uh, which wraps Babel, which um, does some neat stuff with trans, uh, trans blocks and um, the get text strings, or the get text functions. Uh, and one of the things that it does is it makes this safe. So you don't have to use the safe filter, um, which is nice. We trust our localizers, or we give our localizers commit access to the localization repo. So there's a level of trust there already. Um, it doesn't require anything else. The fewer instances of the safe filter we have, uh, the less our security review folks have to go through and look at it. Um, we know that this is, you know, this is not in, there's no user data in this string, right? So we trust it. Um, Jingo, the template adapter that I, or temp, yeah, template adapter that I mentioned, includes two filters by default for doing string formatting. So here, um, we know that interpolating in, or using any Python formatting on a Jinja markup object marks it as unsafe. So here we have user data. Um, it gets formatted in. That marks it as unsafe. That means the string gets auto-escaped. Uh, everything works really well. That occasionally isn't enough, um, in which case we have this FE filter. Now, here we've got HTML in the string and user data, so what FE does is it escapes every, every argument that goes into it, uh, and then it interpolates it and marks the result as safe. Um, these are the only acceptable ways in our code reviews to localize a string in a template. Um, you're not allowed to say use the F filter and then use safe. Uh, that is an immediate R minus, which is maybe eternal, but denied code review. Um, yeah, so 
Localization can be a little bit tricky. Ideally, you can keep as much HTML out of your uh, localized strings as possible, but it's not always possible. Um, CSERF or cross-site request forgeries. So Django's built-in uh, CSERF protection works. It works quite well. Um, it does not work incredibly well when you have different apps on different subdomains. And you might have noticed that I've mentioned support.mozilla.org, input.mozilla.org, add-ons.mozilla.org. You know, we have lots of different apps on different subdomains, which is kind of a pathological case there. If one of those apps gets compromised, the CSERF protection can be pretty easily circumvented by setting cookies um, for the wrong subdomain. So we wrote a package called Django Session CSERF, which works well for us because our session, sessions are all uh, secure HTTP only. Um, and it reduces the, uh, the vector of attack there. So there's still a cookie set when you're doing, if you don't have sessions turned on for everybody, for anonymous users, but it's you know, limited generally to login forms. Uh, so then you start a session and then your CSERF nonces are stored in the session instead of being stored in a cookie. Um, there's also a couple of specific issues around flash and header spoofing, but um, the biggest one is the subdomain thing. So Django session CSERF, uh, it's a bit of an improvement. But if you don't have that, then. Um, for injection, we just use the ORM. SQL, uh, if you're writing raw SQL, uh, use the dot raw method. Uh, use it correctly, do what the docs tell you to, but try to avoid it. Um, I haven't, I, ha I mean, we've come across cases where the ORM generated pathological or otherwise just non-performance SQL. It's pretty rare though uh, for most simple things. And if you've got really complicated stuff going on, um, raw works, works correctly, uh, just follow the docs. The docs are really clear. Um, so FireSheep uh, was a session hijacking. And the way that we get around this is we use SSL for anything with sessions. We use SSL for login pages, for registration pages, for um, everybody who's logged in. Uh, many of our sites are just SS, you know, HTTPS all the time. Um, a couple of them are HTTPS when you're logged in, but not when you're not. Um, certs are cheap. There's no reason not to do it that way. It's not 100% secure. Um, obviously, you can still man in the middle. It's just more work, and it's generally more work than people are going to do. It's much more work than sitting in a coffee shop with fire sheep and sniffing people's Facebook passwords. Um, then all you have to do is flip one setting in Django, turn on uh, session cookie secure, set it to true. Um, and use HTTP only, HTTP only cookies wherever possible. Um, if you don't need the cookie in JavaScript, don't send it to JavaScript. It just reduces the amount of data that can be leaked out. Uh, we have a package called Commonware, which you know, sort of, it's a crap name for just things that didn't really deserve their own package too small. One of the things that it does is it monkey patches uh, request or response.set cookie to be HTTP only by default. Um, yeah, the more, the, the fewer cookies available in JavaScript, the you know, less risk there is from an actual XSS vector. Um, and finally, you know, use uh, the frame options middleware that's in Django 1.4. Um, if you're not using Django 1.4, we have frame options middleware that does the exact same thing in uh, commonware. It, but, you know, that's, I don't know if you can really tell, but that's a bunch of nested frames and then an onion. I don't know why there's an onion. Um, <laughs> and finally, you know, the nice thing about uh, using one framework for almost everything or for as much as we can, using the same set of shared libraries, using the application template. Um, it makes staying up to date much, much easier. So everything being the same, we only really have to watch out for security updates in Django, not Django and Rails and Kohana and Cake. Um, we do our best to get, as, to get up to date as soon as possible after a security release. Um, and you know, we can just mail sort of everybody if there's a new version of Bleach or there's a new version of Django rate limit or there's, you know, we discover a new version of something else that we use. Uh, we can just email our entire team and say, hey, Everybody go make sure this is up to date. Um, staying up to date is 
really key spot, especially the 001 releases. Those are the ones that contain security fixes, not new features. So uh, sharing everything makes it a lot easier to stay up to date. Um, so bots, this is where we get into a little bit of the whole user experience versus security thing. So bots are bad, right? Um, they spam things uh, or they try to brute force um, passwords. And so this is usually how people respond, right? Uh, Hebrew and some word. Um, and the thing about CAPTCHAs is that user, they're, they're a terrible user experience. Nobody likes them. I mean, raise your hand if you like CAPTCHAs. OK, uh, didn't really expect it. Um, I've heard people talking, or I've read blog posts, uh, listing up to 33% conversion rate impact from having a CAPTCHA at all. I think more typical is five to 10, but that's still kind of a lot, right? Um, so you don't really want to have a CAPTCHA all the time, but you do want to prevent people from brute forcing, right? Um, so can we do better? Well, yes. Uh, rate limiting is a huge improvement over um, CAPTCHAs, but rate limiting by itself, uh, you could end up with some sort of denial of service vector. So one of the things that Django rate limit, which is a package that we use, allows you to do is not only look at the IP address that it requests are coming from and limit that, but also to look at the value of any particular form field. So if you have a login form, you can say, I want to look at the username. That allows you to take either single source, um, which might be brute forcing one username or might be you know, scanning usernames with common passwords. Uh, it also allows you to take multiple sources that are brute forcing one username. Uh, it does not allow you to rate limit things where you have lots of different sources trying lots of different usernames because that's just sort of what normal behavior looks like. Um, but if we just blocked everything that uh, got that tripped the rate limit, then I could try to log in as, you know, I could try James with fake passwords over and over and over until I rate limited it. And then the legitimate James couldn't log in. So what we prefer to do is, for things like that, add a CAPTCHA to the form, or more realistically, uh, delete a CAPTCHA from the form unless the rate limit is, for reasons that it's just easier to do that that way in Django. Um, but add a CAPTCHA to the form so that the user can still log in. It's just that now they don't get to, uh, they don't, there is a CAPTCHA, but it's not there for most people most of the time. Um, so sometimes people think of the, you know, I mentioned bcrypt and scrypt and pbkdo2. Um, these are slow and they're slow on purpose. Um, but slow algorithms and any sort of expensive calculation uh, are risky and you want to rate limit anything that's going to do this before the calculation takes place. Um, here's why. So if we say bcrypt takes about 300 milliseconds to hash a password and that's roughly what work factors are set to now. Um, and you have, let's say, 24 worker processes. Um, then all I really have to do is issue something like 70 to 100 requests a second and I can tie up all of your worker processes hashing passwords. So you want to put the rate limiting in front of uh, anything expensive. Bcrypt is an obvious example because it's designed to take time. But you know, if there's things in your app that are slow, you want to rate limit those um, that you know are slow and you want to rate limit those, then you should put the rate limiting in front of the calculation. Common event format logging. Um, logging login attempts, uh, registration attempts, whether they're successful or not. This is a tool that our security folks use um, for intrusion detection. Uh, there's a package we've maintained called CEF. It's on PyPy. Um, there's links to it later. Uh, it's used with some commercial applications. Uh, it's very helpful for pattern recognition and all sorts of things that are a little bit beyond the scope of what I actually deal with. But um, it's really easy to set up. You can use it with your syslogger, uh, or you can use the CEF library. Um, so there are a couple of other things um, that browsers are doing to improve the security of web apps in general. 
Um, one of them is frame options, like I said, that protects pretty much everything above IE8 uh, from click jacking. There's middleware and decorators and everything in Django 1.4. Um, if you're not using Django 1.4 for some reason, upgrade. Stay up to date. Um, easy as pie. Uh, content security policy is something that we're working on. Uh, we being Mozilla are working on with uh, WebKit. Um, I think there's somebody from Mozilla and somebody from Chrome team both uh, as editors on this project. It's kind of a fast moving spec at the moment. Um, so Django CSP is a library I maintain that's had a little bit of trouble keeping up with it. But um, essentially, it just allows us to tell scripts not to execute. Um, default policy is something along the lines of only allow script and image content from uh, this domain, from my, you know, self. Uh, inline scripts won't run. Click handlers in the HTML won't run. Um, domains. JavaScript from evil domains won't run. Uh, for Firefox, you send X content security policy. For WebKit, you send X WebKit CSP. Uh, I think IE10 is going to support this partially. Um, WebKit and Firefox, like I said, they're moving a little quickly. Uh, you can specify all sorts of things, like where scripts are allowed to come from. You can whitelist domains. Uh, you can whitelist where images are allowed to come from. You can whitelist where um, any sort of other media is allowed to come from. And the browser will not load stuff that's not whitelisted, which is really nice. Um, browser's helping you. It doesn't work in old browsers, but it's a nice thing. So one of our you know, standards in best practices is that uh, unless it's a page that for some reason needs to be extremely optimized to the point where we're inlining everything, and you, in which case we can turn on the inlined, uh, we can, you, there's a content security policy configuration to turn on inline script. Um, we write code that will pass the content security policy. Um, it has a report only mode, which I'm working on in Django CSP right now in a 2.0 to do something more interesting than just email admins, which is what it does now. Um, so you can sort of turn on CSP and see where your violations are. Uh, if you don't have any user content on the page, then there's less to worry about. But when you do have user content on a page, it's uh, you know it's another layer of protection. So the spec is, like I said, a bit of a moving target, but it's um, it's there. So I actually think that's about it. So there's the very long URL, even with the URL shortener. Um, that should work right now. If it doesn't work already, then I'll, we'll fix it. Um, and any questions? <laughs> the long walk up to the micro. So uh, having proudly just upgraded to Django 1.3, and being the security advocate for my group, Tell me, what's my argument for pushing for 1.4? Well, at the very least, you should get to 1.3.2, which is the latest security release. Um, the biggest argument is that you want to stay on top of these things, because the longer you go without doing it, the more expensive it's going to be. Um, if you're developing new features on 1.3 uh, and then you upgrade, you're going to have to do any sort of the, any of the, the incompatible changes are going to have to apply to all of that, too. Um, if you can get to 1.4 sooner than later, then you minimize that. Um, at, like I said, at the very least, get to 1.3.2 um, and stay on top of that. But know that when 1.5 comes out, 1.3 is going to be deprecated and not going to get security patches anymore. So to stay up to date and to stay secure, you're going to need to eventually make this move. The sooner you can, the less code you're going to have to migrate. Thank you. All right, um, so uh, the admin is awesome. It gives you access to your content. And often, if you're doing a small scale site, uh, it's sort of your primary mode for uh, letting the users input data. That's sort of how it was designed. Um, but when it comes to security, I always fear that it's like not a gaping hole, but a bit of a hole. Um, 
if in your rate limiting, do you have uh, options that enable you to integrate in the admin nicely, or is there any, uh, that's something I've always sort of wanted to be able to do with the admin, and, and I know there's been some discussion about potentially baking it in, but there are a lot of hard trade-offs there as well, so do you have any comments about that? Um, I don't love exposing the admin to normal users, even on a small scale site. Um, there are a couple of issues with it. One is that if you give a user the ability to edit users, they can elevate themselves and anybody else to super user. Mm -hmm. So there are definitely issues with uh, the admin and security. We try to minimize the number of super users that we have because of that, and we try to write uh, you know, functionality to edit and change any other site content without going through the admin so that we can use um, sort of more fine-grained permission model than what the admin does. I don't, I don't know that Django rate limit would work as is with the admin. I mean, like I said, it's a decorator, but I'm not entirely sure because of the way the admin auto-discovers things that you would really be able to go through and, and do that. Um, I would love to see a couple of things in the admin. I would love to see re-authentication um, when I go there if I'm a super user. Uh, I would love to see rate limiting, um, although you know you don't necessarily need rate limiting if you have things like reauthentication and you encourage people not to use the admin as the main interface for editing content. Um, but I don't. I guess does that answer your, your question? Like, I, mean, I, I mean, I agree that obviously on a large production site you can obviously you should have the resources to create an alternative. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of smaller sites out there where it might not be realistic. So. Maybe some things can be done to make it better, but thank you. So I have a question about a security best practice that I don't think you covered in your talk. Every once in a while, people at Mozilla think they may have found a bug in Django with security implications. Is there a best practice for that, James? <laughs> yes. Um, if you think you have a bug in Django with security implications, email, I believe it's security at djangoproject.com. Uh, there's a security group, they will look at it. Um, that's the responsible disclosure uh, for Django, is security at djangoproject.com, uh, instead of just going to track and filing it publicly. <laughs> Hi, um, this might be a little beyond scope, but uh, have you wrestled with cross-domain session management at all? We have not really dealt with that. We try to sort of avoid it. Um, Cross-domain session management is going to mean you're purposely setting cookies that are accessible across multiple domains. You can still make it secure. Um, you can still make it HTTP only, and you should. Uh, I don't have much um, better advice than that, really. Uh, you know, you set the cookie on the domain that you have to set it on. There are settings for that, but it's not a, if you can avoid it, better to avoid it. Um, if you can't, do the best you can. Wild card certs aren't that expensive either. So, Any more questions or I think, uh, all right, thank you. <laughs>